Amen. What a blessing to be in the house of the Lord. And uh, good to have brothers uh, coming in, sisters coming in from around the country to be able to celebrate the pig roast with us. We're excited about all of you that are here. Asked, uh, asked Johnny today, hey, how's it going with the guys that are coming in from uh, different places? And he said, man, I love the fellowship. I love the fellowship. How good it is for us to be able to have that sweet fellowship in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Would you turn in your Bibles to Matthew for a moment? We're going to take a break from our uh, study through Isaiah as um, we do have this time of celebrating the pre And so let me just make sure that all here understand this is a, a midweek service that we have here at Calvary Chapel Romaland. And the community church is uh, beginning to be able to, to grab a, a hold of, if you will, uh, the vision that, that we have um, to be those that are ready to win, send, and win and train and send, uh, to be missionary-minded, to have the attitude that in every one of our locations, no matter where that be, whether it's uh, in our home, in our neighborhood, uh, in the school that we attend, uh, in our workplace, uh, in our places of recreation, no matter where it is that we go, that we need to have a missionary mind, a mind that is focused on being able to present the gospel in some manner of fashion uh, to those that are around us, namely, that we'll present the gospel through the way that we live out the gospel, that our true belief in Jesus Christ and Him being Messiah him being the Savior of the world, and having the gratitude that we have in our hearts for saving us from our sin as he died on Calvary for each one of us, would promote us, motivate us to being uh, those that are looking around at all times and trying to figure out how it is that I can not only live that Christian life that I've called to live, uh, to walk worthy, if you will, of the calling by which you are called, but also uh, to be ready to promote in heralding or preaching, that word is in our scripture, uh, the gospel message to others, uh, looking for those opportunities to be able to speak to them about Jesus. What a blessing it is to be able to have the answer to every problem in the world Amen. here in our scripture. Amen. We have the, we have the answer. And the answer is Jesus. And so all we have to do and all that God has called us to do is be faithful to being those that are ready to share him with others, even as he has been shared with us. Amen? Amen. And so Matthew's gospel, if you would, turn there with me into chapter 9, and let me take you to a passage for a moment. And then tonight we're going to have a a special couple guys be able to come and share with us. Uh, David and Juliana um, are here with us tonight. They're going to be headed to Ecuador uh, to be able to, on Monday they're leaving for Ecuador, uh, to be there a month and then to be able to come back for a short period to get their things in order and return back in April for six months to a year uh, commitment to being able to bring the light of Jesus into that place. Amen? And so, but here's the coolest part about that for me. Uh, David and I were at a chaplain's meeting this week and got to just have time together and reacquaint, and he told me what was going on. And the blessing of that is that David in 2000 was sitting in one of your seats. He came through the ministry of u turn to Christ. Amen? Amen. And, he, and, and the Lord has put his marriage together. The Lord has allowed him to be uh, trained up. The Lord has allowed him to have opportunity to be able to go out and be a missionary uh, and take different trips. And now a, a more permanent one is open. God tells us that he's, he's set already in order good works for us to be about. And so it is that all we have to do is step through those doors that he opens 
and not try and push through the ones he's closed. Amen? And so a blessing, David's going to come share with us. Joanna, I don't know if you're coming up to be able to share, but we're going to bring you up to pray over you guys before we close our service. And then secondly, Pastor Angel is back home with us for a bit. Amen? <laughs> Pastor Angel is here. And the cool part is Pastor Angel just returned from a mission trip to Ecuador and to the very place where David and Juliana will be going. And so he's going to come up and share uh, after David does a little bit about that trip and uh, what's going on there and then to be able to deliver a little word to us as well. So Matthew chapter 9 and looking at verse 35. The Bible says this. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. I want to make sure that we see here that the Lord only did one thing, and that was preach the gospel. That was the only thing that was on his heart. Every city that he went into and every town that he village that he visited, the most important thing was preaching the gospel, that he truly is Messiah that they've been waiting for. And so the Lord visits all the places, and what does he say? Preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And then secondly, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Let me just tell you that I am the Messiah you've been waiting, and let me show you as I heal all the sickness, not some of the sicknesses, not a few of the sicknesses and diseases, but the word says all of the sickness and disease. He wanted to make sure that they knew that he was the Messiah, God himself, come to the earth, able to heal all that were sick. And it says, but when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd and so the lord looks out on the multitude of the people and the you can imagine the multitude that would have been gathered can't, can't you imagine if jesus is healing and everybody's getting well and he's going you know from uh, chalks children hospital and healing all the children that there would be a great multitude that would be following him that there would be those from all over the country and the world that would be flying in for the touch of Jesus, for the healing of Jesus. The multitude. And he looked out on them, and the word of God says he had compassion. They were lost. Though they had come for their miracle touch, they were lost. And the Lord looks on them as a shepherd and he looks on them as weary sheep that had no understanding of who the good shepherd was standing before them. And he goes on to tell us, as he looks out at the multitude and he sees with a compassionate heart, listen, I want to ask you, do you look out on the multitudes of people that you know are without the Lord with compassion? No, there's a lot of times that we just we become very judgmental rather than compassionate, don't we? We look out on a world around us that's full of sin and we say almost like, hey, you know what? They deserve what they're getting. Let them have it. Instead of having a heart like Jesus that's full of compassion and says, man, what can I do to make a difference in this one person's life? What can I do to be able to save them from their sin, to be able to introduce them to the Savior of the world and allow them to have the freedom that I now have. He looks out with compassion, and the testimony is to you and I to be able to put ourselves in front of the mirror and to be able to ask, is that really who I am? Because Jesus said, follow me. And again, when he said, follow me, he meant follow me in everything. And so if we're going to be those that are Christ-like, that are little Christ, that are Christians, then we need to have the same heart of compassion for the lost that Jesus had. 
We need to be concerned about those that the rest of the world is kicked to the curb, that doesn't want anything to do with. We need to be those that look out on the ones that are wealthy and intellectual and think that they've got it all together except that they're going to hell for all eternity because they don't know Jesus. We need to look out with compassion on the world around us and ask, what is it that I can do that will allow me to be able to bring them to the place of reasoning with the Lord and bowing before him? He goes on. And he says this in verse 37, then he said to his disciples, the harvest is true, plentiful. There's there's tons of them out there, guys. That's what the Lord is saying. There's a load of people that are right before you. The harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send labors into the harvest. The Lord just says, look, there's there's lots of them that we need to reach. Labors are few. People that are ready to give up everything that they have to be able, even to give up their reputation or, if you will, their popularity. Huh. How many of us have passed up the opportunity to be able to speak out Jesus in a group of people because we didn't want to be unpopular with them? That that we were shying away from making a stand for the Lord because somebody might get offended. Let let me just help you with this. The (laughs) gospel is offensive. The Bible is very clear to tell us. You and I are called to be faithful in presenting the truth that is in these scriptures. You and I know today as we read these words that the Lord is saying, hey, there's bunches of them that are still out there that have not received him. In fact, we know for sure, don't we, that there's one because we haven't been raptured yet. (laughs) And it only happened when that last one, right, commits to the Lord. Man, let's be busy about reaching that one. Let's be busy about spending our life. Well, tonight I'm blessed to be able to have these two guys to come and share because they've heard the call. They've answered the call. They've gone in short terms and they've gone in loco outreaches, and now it's time for David and Juliana to go long term. And so I'm going to invite David up to share now, and would you welcome him as he comes to be able to just share and encourage you. Good, e- good evening, guys. Um, I am just, I'm so overwhelmed uh, to, tonight. God's timing is always perfect. So when Pastor Jerry said that we were at a chaplain's breakfast the other day, um, that's what I mean by God's timing being just perfect. I didn't expect him to be there. I didn't expect to run into him, but we did. We had a very good conversation, and I briefly gave him an update on what we were doing in the ministry. Now, in 2000, um, I was here at U-Turn for Christ. Um, Let me just tell you guys that When I walk in here and I see everybody sitting in these seats, I get very emotional. Here's here's why. Because God 
transformed my life in this ministry. I want to be transparent with you. When I got here in 2000, I was here for about a week. And for that first week, I thought about how am I going to get out of here? I'm being honest, right? How many, how many know what I'm talking about? Huh? Come on. Here we go. Here we go. All right. I'm in the right place. But listen, guys, after my first week, I knew that God wanted to do something in my life. I knew that he had me in the right place. So I stood, and God began to do a work in my life. So yes, growing up, I had the same issues, the same addictions a lot of you guys uh, have here. That's what led me to U-Turn for Christ. Drugs, alcohol, gambling, the whole nine yards, broken relationships. And I always thought that God was upset with me. I always thought that God was just a, 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 just a tyrant, if you will. I had no idea who he was. Um, and I always felt condemned. When I got to the ranch, I just felt this condemnation on me. And I couldn't shake it off. But I'm reminded of what Paul the Apostle says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. He says, as for me, he says, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified and the world's interest in me has also died. Guys, so a word of encouragement tonight, and then I'm going to get into just a little testimony as about what God is doing in my marriage with my beautiful bride. So again, guys, in 2000, I completed the program, and I knew God was calling me. I knew what God was calling me into the ministry. Because I remember the pastors that I, that I sat under in 2000, Pastor Mario, Pastor Teddy, um, and the leadership there. They would always tell me, bro, God's got a calling on your life. God's got a calling on your life. But I didn't believe it because I thought to myself, how can God use me? After everything I did, you see, there was a time when my kids didn't want to talk to me. There was a time when nobody wanted anything to do with me, right? There was a time when I couldn't even come home to mom and dad's house because I was just chaotic. My whole life was just chaotic. It was crazy. I know a lot of you guys can relate to what I'm saying. A lot of you gals can relate to what I'm saying. I'm not forgetting because, listen, man. I know what it's like. So a word of encouragement to the men's home and the women's home. Listen, do not leave prematurely. I beg of you. Paul uses that word in the Bible. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. And I'm begging you. Each and every one of you in the ranch, and this is specifically for those that are in the ranch, do, do not leave prematurely. Stay put. You graduate from the ranch, if God tells you to stay, you stay. Don't move on without God's blessing. 
Amen. So fast forward, gentlemen, ladies. I married my wife in 2009. My wife is from Ecuador. While she was born here in the United States, her mom and dad were born in Ecuador. My wife and I go way back. But I don't have enough time to sit here and tell you about our whole testimony. Maybe after service, if you want to know, just come and ask us. But my wife has family in Ecuador. The Lord began to open a door and to stir my heart in 2015. Actually, 2014. I took a trip to Ecuador with my wife. It was just me and her. We went out there. And... When we got there, I remember it was the holiday season, so we took a bunch of toys, a bunch of dolls, and we walked around a city in, in Quito, Quito, Ecuador, before we got to Guayaquil. And it's just me and my wife. We're walking around. We're just looking around. We see mom and dad with little babies, and we'd hand them dolls, and we tell them, Jesus loves you. Forgive me. Guys, I don't belong up here. But it's by the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ. <laughs> so in 2015, after our 2014 trip, in 2015... We were fellowshipping with a gentleman at church, a good friend of mine. I just spoke to him today, Ernest Ramirez. He was an assistant fire chief for LA County Fire Department. He's a good friend of mine. He says, bro, he says, we're doing an outreach with the uh, uh, firefighters for Christ, the Bo Bomberos de Cristo. He says, I need you to train these guys. He said, because I was a class A instructor at the time. He says, I need you to train these guys on the fire rigs. I said, bro, I'm in. I'm in. So that's what I did. I started training these guys, right? We, 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 we trained them here. We had outreaches here. A lot of firefighters in Ecuador, raise your hands, receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. It was beautiful. We went back in 2016 to visit my wife and I, just us, to follow up on those firefighters that gave their lives to Christ. It was just me and my wife. We went over there. We went from town to town to town to town. They picked us up at the airport in a fire truck, I mean in a, in a fire car, and we were rolling cold three for about three hours down the highway in a, in a, in a, fire, in a fire car, right, with the sirens going, right, babe? And we were moving. And I'm thinking to myself, what, what, am, I, what, what, what am I doing here? It's like, I mean, I know what I'm called to do. I know what I'm called to do. I learned that here in the, where I'm sitting, where you guys are sitting right now. I learned that the harvest is plenty, but the labors are few, as Pastor Jerry said. And as he's reading this scripture right now, I'm thinking to myself, my God, that's the same message coming out in, when I was here in 2000. You see, it's contagious, guys. The word of God is it's just it's beautiful. It's, there's life in it. So we get there in 2016, and, um, you know, we, we reach out. We, we're building relationships at this time. And uh, in, uh, I believe, 2000, uh, anyways, I'm not, I'm not good with dates. So my, my wife's kind of looking at me like, well, no, that's not the date. That's not, well, it's a, listen, dates aren't important. Here's what's important. We took a team back to, uh, to, Cal, uh, to uh, Calvary Chapel uh, in uh, Cuenca in Ecuador, we took a team out there of about 12 of us from Calvary, Monrovia. And uh, we went out there and we just swarmed that about three or four, five cities. And we gave them the gospel. We had outreaches. It was just a beautiful time. But all this time, God is stirring my heart, guys. He's stirring my wife's heart. Now, my wife being from Ecuador and her family's in Ecuador... My wife's like, babe, let's go now. And I'm like, well, I can't go now because I got stuff to do. I got work. I got a business to tend to, right? And um, so if it was up to my wife, we'd be in Ecuador right now, okay? But uh, 
again, it's, it's, it, she knows it's all about God's timing. And so today, um, we have a good relationship with Pastor Jose Mero. Pastor Jose Mero is with Calvary Chapel, Guayaquil. Uh, he was launched out by Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale. Okay, the church has been there, what, three, four years now? Four years. And God is doing something big there. I know uh, uh, Pastor Angel will be up here shortly. Uh, he just got back a week ago. And uh, he's going to share a little more in detail uh, what God uh, is doing up there. But I, my wife and I hosted Pastor Jose Mero um, last year sometime. And he was at my house. And me and him were sitting in my backyard and we were having a really good conversation, just a great conversation. And here's what he tells me. He goes, he tells me about uh, the rehab that they're doing up there. It's a secular rehab, guys, that they have up there. But God opened the door for the, uh, Calvary Chapel, Guayaquil, to go into a secular rehab and just give them the full gospel of Jesus Christ. So guys are getting saved over there. Amen. Amen. Yes. Glory to God. Glory to God. So men are getting saved over there. But here's the thing. They come out, right? They go to church on Sundays. But how many of us know that we need to be discipled once we get out? We need to be discipled because you know what? If we're not discipled by our leaders and those who are in the ministry that have been in the ministry for a long time. Listen, we're going to go right back to the muck and the miry clay. It's a guarantee, gentlemen, ladies, it's a guarantee that we'll go back into the world if we're not being discipled and we're not following Jesus Christ and being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. So he tells me, he says, Dave, he goes, the Lord is doing a mighty work in, in Ecuador. He goes, I need leaders like you that would help me disciple men that are coming out of the rehab. The hair on my arms stood up. And again, coming from this ministry, God is calling me right back to an addiction ministry. And that's huge for me. It's confirm. Listen, guys. God will blow your mind. And some of you guys, I can see it in your face. You're like, bro, I hear you. I hear you loud and clear. And I'm glad you hear me, guys. I'm so glad you guys are here and listening. So this is what we're doing. We're moving forward. So I told my wife, I said, hon, let's shut down the business. I have my own business. I'm a, I got a small transportation business. I drive a big rig. So we shut it down. We sold the truck. We're closing all, we're, we're shutting down all the legal stuff. And I'm thinking, when, I woke up the other day and I'm like, wait a minute, what did I just do? <laughs> wait a minute, what did I just do? Right? But listen, guys, that was just short, short term, trust me. Because I know the calling of God upon my life. I know God's calling. And for many years, for many years, ladies, gentlemen, I allowed my circumstances to define who I am. And that's what kept me stagnant. That's what kept me dormant is because I allowed my circumstances to define who I was. But God. But God, t 
turn with me to Psalm chapter 139, please. Psalm 139. Psalm 139, this is a, a psalm uh, from King David. We know that King David, he took the throne after King Saul. God said, I am going to choose a man after my own heart. So I want to just point out a couple bullets here. And I want to just focus on God's word. In Psalm 139, verse 1, and remember, for many years I allowed my circumstances to define who I was. But when I began to read passages of scripture like Psalm 139, the word of God began to give me clarity on who I was in Jesus Christ. Verse 1, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Verse 4, for there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me it is high I cannot attain it drop down to verse 13 for you formed my inward parts you covered me in my mother's womb I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well verse 17 how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Listen, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Do not let your circumstances today define who you are. Okay? God didn't make junk. In Genesis, he says, let us create man in our image, in our likeness. So that's what he did. He create, We are created in his image. So remember, do not allow your circumstances to define you. And I say it again and again, I want it to stick. Because when you guys get back to that ranch, you're probably going to start thinking again, oh, my God, look at where am I at? What am I doing? Listen, God is preparing you a work ahead 22 years later 22 years later I never thought that I'd be a chaplain with the Riverside Sheriff's Office never I used to run from the police now I'm running with the police you see this this is what God does this is what he does so guys again just a word of encouragement. I want to leave Pastor Angel some time. I want him to share uh, what God is doing in Ecuador. So, um, guys, let me just pray for you and uh, pray for the men in, 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 the, in the ranch and in the, in the women's, uh, women's ranch as well. Heavenly Father, my God, as we remain in your wonderful presence, Father, I ask you now, Lord God, bless these men. Bless these women, Father. Continue to draw them closer to you, my God. Father, I pray, Father for miracles in their lives. I pray that you would restore, my God, what the locusts have eaten. My God, I pray, build them up, build them up, Father. Send them out. As you said in your word, Lord, the harvest is plenty, but the labors are few. Raise up those labors tonight, my God. We love you, Papa.
In Jesus' name, amen. If you guys, uh, if you guys are new to the uh, ministry of U Turn for Christ, you may not know uh, just what a a great pastor uh, is leading this flock. Amen, Amen to that. Uh, I was in Ecuador and uh, I had an opportunity as I got there, uh, to share at uh, Calvary Chapel, Guayaquil's uh, midweek service. And it was a blessing uh, to see a young church that's been operating for four years, but in the midst of those four years, uh, they found themselves right in the midst of the COVID. And the church in His grace has preserved the church, and they're back to uh, having services just like we are having here tonight and the church is about 45 people strong and I've never met Pastor Jose I saw him share a little bit at Calvary Chapel uh, Monrovia and when I did my heart was stirred and as the Lord uh, through praying and God settling Pastor Richard's heart in my heart and God making it very clear that he wanted us uh, to go down to Ecuador I couldn't help myself uh, stop in Colombia. My favorite Colombian is in the house tonight. Pastor Heido, I love that man. And when I get to Ecuador, I really don't know what to expect. I don't know if they're going to have tacos like they have in Ensenada. So I don't know what to expect, right? Ecuadorians can cook some food, but not like Mexicans. I'm sorry, okay? <laughs> Just the way it is. Preach it. So I get down there. And Pastor Jose says, look, we've got this uh, midweek Bible study, but there's an opportunity. This woman that my wife and I have been ministering to, she just so happens to be a principal at a high school. Would you like to go down there and share the gospel? I said, huh, let me think. Of yes. <laughs> and so we get down there and we get to the school and uh, it was beautiful to watch. Uh, to see that there's still countries that are allowing pastors to come in and to address an auditorium full of students. But it just so happened that the day that we were there was family day in Ecuador. So it's not just the students that are there, it's the parents that are there as well. And the way that the school is designed, uh, it basically looks like a, a prison yard in the middle and the yard is surrounded by buildings. And so we get the first auditorium, the first uh, group of uh, youngsters. And uh, auditorium, probably about this many people in the auditorium for that first one. And we're able to share the gospel. 35 people come to the Lord. And we go out from there and the principals prepared some lunch for us. And she said, look, uh, we're not really kicking off the father, uh, the, the parent uh, day, the family day, till about noonish. Would you like to stay? And uh, we'll give you another auditorium full of kids. And I said, absolutely. So we're upstairs. And all of a sudden, I'm looking down. And I see they've got like, you know, like snow cone machines. And they've got their little setup. And all of a sudden, I see a podium and a microphone. A little music, little thing. And I kid you not, man, I saw Pastor Jerry's face. And I knew what he would have done if he'd have seen that. He said, Angel, come here. We're not even asking for permission. Let's go turn this thing on, grab that microphone, and let's give them Jesus. That's just the guy that I know. I was in the Philippines with Pastor in 2006 in a mudslide. 
And we traveled 10 hours that night. True story. We're hanging onto these barrels of oil in the back of these Filipino army trucks. And, but when we get to the landslide area, they're not letting anybody in. I kid you not. Here comes this convoy, this military convoy. Okay. Pastor, we're told we're not going. So in Jerry's mind, it's no, we are going. Right? Then take no for an answer. That's just the kind of guy that he is. I kid you not. He stands in the middle of the highway with his Riverside Chaplain badge. <laughs> like that means anything in the Philippines, right? <laughs> and he stands there and this convoy comes to a screeching halt. And this Filipino colonel pops the door open and he's looking at Pastor Jerry like, you crazy white man, what are you doing? And pastor, man, I've seen my pastor just seize a moment like few people can. And he just looks at this man and he says, look, we're chaplains. We were at 9-11 Oklahoma City. We want to get in there and help in any way that we can. And the colonel looks at pastor. He looks at his driver. He looks at him again like, you crazy. Get in the back. And that's how we ended up in the back of that convoy <laughs> holding on to these barrels, man. It's just insane. And so in the second auditorium, 135 more Ecuadorians came to Jesus Christ. Amen. And guys, you and I, we all know that it's all about Jesus. Uh, David said something to, uh, when he was up here. He said, I don't deserve to be up here. Uh, trust me, if there's someone in this room who doesn't deserve to be up here right now, it's me. I just want to share a little bit about the word. I want to share in Genesis chapter 44. If you would go there. I want to read one verse in Genesis chapter 44. We're going to read verse 18. And then we're going to jump down to uh, verses 3, 4 of chapter 45. The Bible says this. Then Judah came near to him, speaking of Joseph, and said... Oh, my Lord, please let your servant speak a word in my Lord's hearing and do not let your anger burn against your servant for you are even like Pharaoh. Chapter 45, verse 3 and 4. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him. For they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now you got to understand something. Judah is the fourth born of Jacob. His older brother was Reuben, okay? Then you have Simeon and Levi. And Judah is the fourth son to Jacob, Joseph being the tenth of his children. Now you and I both understand, we understand that, we hear it all the time, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. But when you backtrack, if you know your history, before you come to this verse in Genesis chapter 44, where it says that Judah drew near, unbeknownst to him that it was Joseph, have it in your mind that Judah is drawing near a man who looks like an Egyptian. The Bible tells us that Joseph would communicate with his brothers through an interpreter. He doesn't understand that he's talking with his brother. But let me paint a quick picture so that you and I can understand the gracious God that you and I serve. See, the first recorded words that Judah ever spoke in Scripture are found in Genesis 37. In the first words that Judah speaks, he requests or recommends to his brothers that they would not kill Joseph, but that they would throw him in a pit 
that they would sell him to the Ishmaelites that were coming so that he would become a slave in Egypt. This is Judah. This is Joseph's older brother. This is where Jesus comes from. Judah, the man, when you look at him prior to allowing God to do a work in his heart, Judah was a wicked man. He recommended his brother to be sold, and they sold him. And it wasn't just his brother Joseph that he was affecting. He almost nearly kills his father Jacob with this bright idea that no doubt was birthed in, in hell itself. And when he recommends that his brother be sold, being a very selfish man still, when they come back, taking the tunic that had belonged to Joseph, and they kill a goat, a kid, and they smear it with blood, and they bring it to Jacob. Is this not your son Joseph's tunic? They nearly give the man a heart attack. And Judah, being so wicked and self-centered, Jacob is not wanting to be, he can't be comforted. Even then, it would seem that Jacob is still esteeming Joseph more important than his whole family combined. And in Genesis 38, and guys, understand this. In Genesis chapter 38 and verse 1, it tells us that Judah left his family. Now David was talking about when we come to the ministry, how we try to devise a plan, how we need to leave the ministry of U-Turn for Christ. Please don't. God brought you here for a reason. And God desires to work in your life. And if you allow God to be God in your life, he will change your life. And Judah abandons his family. And what happens is that things get from bad, they go to worse. He marries this woman who's a Canaanite woman. And they have three children. Ur being the first, Onan being the second, and Shelah being the third. And the Bible tells us that Judah's first two children were wicked and that God destroyed them. He killed them because of their wickedness. And Judah thinking, hey, Tamar is probably poisoning the frijoles and my, my children are dying. I'm not giving Sheila to her. And so he's trying to manipulate the situation and hindering his younger son to marry Tamar to raise up a lineage for his older brother or for his children. And you know the story. Tamar proceeds, she hears, it comes to her attention that Judah is going up to, uh, to shear the sheep and she dresses herself up like a prostitute. And you know the story. He has relationships with her. She becomes pregnant. And she gives birth to the first Mexican in scripture, Perez. It's in the Bible. It ain't me. It's right here. Okay? And they come and they tell Judah. They say, Judah, Tamar has played the harlot. And you can tell where Judah's heart is still in a very hardened place. And he says, let her be burned. And when they go grab her and they snatch her up and they're going to burn her, before they do, he says, look, the man that got me pregnant, here is his staff, here is his ring, this is the man, and then Judah knew. Judah sin, as the Bible says, your sin will find you out from the rooftops, it shall be shouted. And he's caught with his hands in the cookie jar. Now this is where the Bible goes dark with Judah. From Genesis chapter 38 all the way to Genesis chapter 43, 44. We don't really know when Judah comes back to the family. But something happened during that silent season. Judah repented. Judah begins to allow God to bring a healing in his heart. He allows Jehovah God to be God in his life. And guys. There was a time when I was in the ministry and God was dealing with me that I thought that it was Pastor Jerry against me. 
For sure, Pastor Aaron is against me. It had nothing to do with them. God was dealing with the hardness in my heart. He was dealing with the pride in my heart. And God took me to Camino, California, U-turn for Christ. And the verse that continued to come to mind was, Be still and know that I am God. And he made me understand, Angel, the only thing that's hindering me from working in you the way that I desire to work is stillness. Stay out of my way. Don't touch it. Don't look at it. Just let me do what I need to do. And for that time, the Bible doesn't tell us, but we'll see when Judah, out of the abundance of the heart, speaketh the mouth, we see Judah, a different and transformed man in those later chapters in the book of Genesis. So during that silent time, something's happened. He's humbled himself. He's allowed God to work in the hardness of his heart. He allowed like Jeremiah chapter 4 verse 4. Hey, allow God to circumcise your heart. Break up the fallow ground. And that's what Judah allowed. He allowed the Lord to break up the fallow ground and for God to truly work in his life. And I see men in this room, the Steve Norgrens that I love, the Carrie Barnetts, men that I know that God desires to raise up and to use in a powerful way. The only thing that is lacking is that I get out of God's way. That's all that's lacking. God didn't call you because you have something to offer him, because you're gifted, because you know that two plus two is four. He didn't call you for those purposes. He chose you because no better vessel can he use that when he's done doing what he has planned to do, no one else can get the glory but him. It was such a tough lesson. I'll tell you. It was a very difficult lesson because I am a very prideful man. I didn't only sit in those chairs one time. It took me three times. And that man sitting in the middle not to quit on me and Pastor Aaron. God wants to do a work. And so when we read in Genesis 44, 18, and Joseph came near, there's a big fill in the blank there. And I think God leaves it blank because you and I know what happens during those fill in the blank seasons. You either surrender and submit, you either allow him to make you the real deal or keep being a phony. Your sin will find you out. And all God wants to do is bless you. You think about Peter in John chapter 21. He's discouraged. He's denied the Lord. And he says to the other knuckleheads, I'm going fishing. Well, we're going fishing with you too. And all night they toil. What are they looking for? What are they trying to catch all night? Fish. And when they realize that it's Jesus that's at the shore and Peter swims to the shore what is the first thing that jesus has prepared on the shore the very thing that they were trying to find in their own strength all night long and came up empty do you realize that when you're sitting there in your bunk and you're trying to draw up this little crazy genius u-turn for christ escape plan that no one's ever thought about before in the history of u-turn for christ right surrender Jesus just wants us to surrender. He just wants us to surrender. That's it. In so many years, I made it so complicated and so difficult when all God wanted was just to surrender. Would I change some things if I could go back? Yes. Maybe. Maybe. I, I don't mean that the way that it sounds, but certain things had to happen. There was a wrestling in my heart. But when Joseph draws near, understand something. 
See, you and I know from James chapter 8, or excuse me, 4, verse 8, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Hebrews tells us in chapter 4 that we are to come, we can come, an open invitation with boldness. We can come with boldness to the throne of grace where we will find mercy and grace. See, Judah doesn't know what, he doesn't know he's talking to Joseph. You and I know who we're talking to. His masterpiece is on the cross. No man, no woman in this room can look at the cross, really study the work what Jesus did on the cross, and truly walk away thinking that Jesus doesn't love you. No way. There's just no way. And whatever it takes that God would break you, would break me, would break us of our own will, let it be written and let it be done. And he came near. He didn't know he was talking to Joseph. In his mind, he's, what else do I have to lose? In our minds, when we draw near to him, you're, you have everything to gain. Because he already lost it all. He didn't, this, he became like a man. And that's what he desires. And Joseph, excuse me, Judah draws near to his brother Joseph, to this Egyptian man. And we don't have time. But he begins to say, look, please don't be angry at me, my Lord. And he paints uh, uh, Joseph a picture and he says, look, um, our older, our younger brother Joseph is dead. And my father's life is wrapped up now in his other son, Benjamin. If you keep Benjamin here, my father will surely have a heart attack. It'll be over for him. See, I don't know if you caught it, but in Genesis 45, the first words that Joseph speaks to his brothers when he reveals himself, I am Joseph, how is father? And that's what our greater than Joseph, Jesus Christ, he wants us to always be mindful of the father's business. When Joseph saw... That his brother Judah's heart was aligned to his own heart. That he cared about his father. Then the Bible tells us in verse 1, he couldn't contain himself anymore. And you know what happened after then? The whole family would begin to inherit all of Joseph's riches. They moved to the best of the land. There was nothing that the family was lacking. When I was reading this story... I realized that for a long time, Jesus, his heart wanted to burst at the seams. But because my heart wasn't aligned to Jesus' heart, I didn't have a concern for the Father the way that he wanted me to. Jesus had to contain himself. And I look around the room and I see men and women that Jesus is not wanting to contain himself. He's waiting for your heart, our hearts, to be aligned to his. And when that happens... Oh my. Oh wow. It's insane. Guys, you're right there. It's 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 it just takes dying. It takes you. I was praying this morning. I was crying. And I said, God, would you just, in my mind, I could almost see like this rag that's been dipped in water. And in my mind, I was like, God, would you just wring every ounce of angel out of angel, please? I don't want to miss out anymore, God, on what you have for my life. I I don't want to go through what I've gone through, Papa. I want my heart to be sensitive. Wring it all out, God. And don't look at me and say, well, Brother Angel, if you knew the things that, bro, if you knew the things that I've done, yeah, a pastor would shoot me. He probably thought about shooting me a couple of times. <laughs> Guys, all it takes, Jesus is waiting that you would draw near. But listen, and I'll close with this. Listen, don't deceive yourself. If you draw near, but your heart isn't right, if you're not done with your own little kingdom, with your own little plan, it's never going to work. It's never going to work. Let us pray.
Father, we just come before you now, Lord, and I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, that you would give us strength. And Father, that you would help us, Lord, to be those that live surrendered lives. Lord, all you desire to do, Lord, is just bless us. You desire, Lord, to do so much for us. Help us, Lord, just to get out of your way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 What a blessing. What a blessing to be able to have hearts like that, be able to talk to us tonight. Amen. Amen. And if you would turn down the lights, there's no way that we can leave this room without giving opportunity for those that know. You haven't asked God to ring you out. You've been satisfied with that that cloth of yourself being saturated with self. And tonight you heard Pastor Angel. <laughs> Pastor Angel was Pastor Angel and then he wasn't. And then he was again. Because he came to that place of knowing there's only one way that I can truly serve the Lord. And that's if I die to self. So I want to give you that opportunity tonight to be able to come forward as the worship team just leads us in the song. You know God has spoken to you. And you need to get right with him. And you're saying, Lord, I want to wring out every bit of self. I'm going to ask the pastors that are here tonight, Pastor Stephen, Angel included, those that are here visiting with us as well as those that are a part of the ministry here at Calvary Chapel Roma Land to come up to be available. I'm going to ask David to come up if you would be here to be able. Bring your wife with you. There will be women that are going to need to be ministered to as well. Juliana can be here to pray with them. And I'm going to ask you just to bow your heads right now. As we go before the Lord, before this song of worship, and just say, Lord, would you help me to be honest? Would you allow me to be able to hear the words that were spoken? And God, allow them to move me by your Spirit to ring out myself. Less of me, Lord, and more of you. In Jesus' name, amen. If that's you, you come forward tonight. Stand before these guys.